And I'm pleased to welcome you to our President's Speaker Series and to today's presentation by Dr. James Canton, CEO and Chairman of the Institute for Global Futures. It's always a pleasure for us to come to Santa Cruz, which is an important part of the service area of CSUMB. About 7% of our students come from Santa Cruz County, and we value the strong relationships we've built here, including those with our colleagues at UC Santa Cruz. Today's venue, the Colligan Theater, highlights another great relationship for CSUMB in Santa Cruz. That is our relationship with Bud and Rebecca Colligan, who provide important financial support for our President's Speaker Series. CSUMB, yes, please, let's thank them. CSUMB works closely with Bud on a number of projects, including the Monterey Bay Economic Partnership, which is seeking to build an inclusive and sustainable economy for the Central Coast. Our discussions at the MBEP often focus on what, might, on what future might look like for our region, and that's why we're pleased to welcome Dr. Canton to speak with us today. Dr. Canton is the author of several books, the most recent being Future Smart, Managing the Game-Changing Trends That Will Transform Your World. A former Apple computer executive and high-tech entrepreneur, he has advised three White House administrations and more than 100 companies. Everyone who thinks about the future, and I guess that's pretty much everyone, has an idea of how he or she would like things to turn out. George Orwell, who suddenly has become a best-selling author again, <laughs> ne nearly 70 years after his death, once wrote, people can foresee the future only when it coincides with their own wishes, and the most grossly obvious facts can be ignored when they are unwelcome. Of course, we as a society cannot afford to ignore facts, unwelcome or otherwise, if we want to make tomorrow better than today. Throughout his distinguished career, Dr. Canton has earned a reputation as an insightful and reliable guide to the changing realities that will shape our world. In his book, Future Smart, Dr. Canton call, talks about making, quote, an evolutionary shift in how we think about our world from being reactive and passive, in which the future just happens, to being proactive and catalysts, true architects of change. I would put it to you that higher education too needs to encourage that kind of thinking, both among our students and in the communities that we serve. During Canton's presentation, CSUMB staff members will be circulating in the audience to pick up any questions you might have for the Q&A session that will follow. Now, please join me in welcoming Dr. James Canton. Well, good afternoon. How is everyone? Good. Ready to take a journey in my time machine into the future? Yes. Just a few of you. I have to work harder at that. Yeah. Well, it's my honor to give you a forecast of what's coming next. Uh, I, as in our introduction, uh, thank you for that. Uh, some of those things are actually true about me. Uh, it's oftentimes, as a futurist, you end up with data or information or uh, points of clarity about what I call predictive awareness that you don't necessarily uh, agree with or not. Uh, you don't e maybe even like them, but your commitment is to your clients. So you're, you're my clients for the day. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. So I may say some things that you don't like or I may say some things you don't agree with. Uh, my forecasts are really based on, as a social scientist, uh, I'm called a futurist, but I'm a social scientist by training. It, they're borne out by our own analytics. So I'm not going to spend so much time telling you how we get there as we're saying, I'm going to cut to the chase and say, okay, here are what we think is happening and when, and what you can maybe do about it is up to you, but I'll be glad to answer some questions. Okay? So let's get going. Um, I run a think tank, and what do we do? We think. Uh, I, I work with and advise lots of governments and, and companies around the world, uh, but a lot of times I, I work with individuals who are just trying to figure out, you know, how to solve a problem. You know, the problem may be about business, it may be about you know, a particular social problem, it may be about how to do something better. And inevitably, it has to do something with technology and innovation, because that's a lot of my DNA. Um, there's a lot of people that do that, and I just have a, the first uh, term I'll kind of suggest to you that I made up, uh, did you know you went back to school today? Did you, did you know that you entered, you entered? This is the extension of the university, right? If I may. Uh, so trend convergence. So trend convergence. The notion that 
it's not just about you know, technology or Moore's law that's driving change, but it's about trend convergence. Oftentimes it's lifestyles, technology, uh, uh, demographics, but also economics. So I look at a variety of different kinds of trends and I figure out how they kind of fit together. Example, um, how many folks would like to live uh, you know, an extra, let's say, uh, 25 to 30 years uh, with the vitality of a 25-year-old? Show of hands, yeah. Yeah, all the, so all the hands go up, yeah. So the algorithm, the business algorithm that I would use to forecast that would be to look at you know, the concentration of, of boomers that are living longer, the concentration of, of, of wealth or certainly decreased wealth, but certainly financial resources of that demographic cohort around the world, right? Might look at it around the world. And then I'd look at drivers like Moore's Law, which is making every technology kind of doubling in power every year more or less, and, and the cost of that technology is costing less. So things like healthcare, which were fairly in the early, early stages of development of healthcare, right? Uh, we haven't really done the early diagnostics thing. We really haven't connected the dots yet between DNA, your DNA, the population's DNA, and health. And we're just beginning to figure out predictive things, like, you know, what's it going to take to keep you living longer and healthier, what the implications are. So we're at fairly the early stage. This is kind of like, not quite the dark ages, but we're going to figure it out in our lifetime. Why? Because the next 10 years are going to seem like the past 100 years. That's how fast things are going to exponentially change, exponentially change in terms of technology, but also lifestyle. Because boomers, for what they pay a dollar in terms of, let's say, healthcare to live another 20 or 30 years with quality of life, right? And, and we have to fix one out of three men in this room be at risk for Alzheimer's. Right? We know that women live longer than men just data-wise today. We think that has something to do with that men don't listen. Can, <laughs> is that true? Is that true? I mean, anybody? 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 Right? Excuse me, what? So, you know, when you look at the data points, they suggest in the next 20 years, 30 years, what, certainly what the boomers pay a dollar for today, Gen X will pay a dime. And then millennials will probably have for free. Right? So who is it in the interest? So I'm going to make... Uh, this is where we go back to school together to be a futurist to look at some of these together, right? You can lay claim to this. So when you consider the burden, let's take Alzheimer's alone, it's over 30 billion plus, actually closer to 50 billion today, today, burden, economic drag on the U.S. economy today of Alzheimer's. Who do you think has the biggest interest in solving Alzheimer's? Anybody in this room? Yeah. Insurance companies? Who else? Yeah. Drug companies? Yeah. Boomers themselves, yeah, and policymakers, government, yeah. So we're concerned about, again, trend convergence, which we're concerned about having Social Security be sustainable, right? We're concerned about being able to, you know, take care of the last stages of life. And we can push that out even five years, get you to live longer and healthier, push that out 10 years. Look at the economic impact. Now, if we can solve Alzheimer's, right, and start to predict it, because we've identified an early Alzheimer's gene, but if we can start to develop the diagnostic to be able to change the mindset around predicting when it might occur, you might create a whole other kind of medicine around predictive medicine that doesn't exist today. So that's why when I say to you, you're living in probably the most exciting time, but this notion of trend convergence, it's these factors together, how fast genomics is changing, emergence of very fast uh, and artificially intelligence being applied to diagnostics, which hasn't really even begun yet. We're still at the treatment modality. So I'm just giving you one slice of kind of what our, our thinking is about where things are going and how exciting it is. Well, other than thinking with folks, also what we do is we think about, you know, how to empower people to get ready for this future. And I write books and I think about things like strategic risk. Strategic risk is, is a way of kind of saying if you don't prepare for this now, right, or become what I refer to as future ready, that's your second term to take away, right? Future readiness is thinking about what is it I need to do to become future ready for my life? And you can do it as an individual, you can do it for your organization, you can do it for your family. You know, what's the future gonna look like? What are we gonna need to be sustainable? What are we gonna need to be effective? What are we gonna need to be healthy? You know, it, it's, it's interesting because if you look at the stages of, of uh, humanity, you look at the stages of people's individual lives, right? There are certain diseases that occur, we know, in the 50 to 65, 70-year-old, 
right, period of time. But those diseases, which are predominantly based on you know, cancer and cardiovascular, actually begin where? They begin, the trajectory begins in your 30s, 40s, and sometimes even your 20s. So we're developing these ways of being able to do better predictions and, and manage risk. But it's not all about healthcare. We build stuff too, other than just thinking about stuff and doing forecasts. We build different kinds of predictive models and ways of being able to you know, look at data and information to make jumps. We've got lots of clients. So the themes of this are we're going to look at a bunch of different trends. I'm going to blow through a lot of things pretty quickly, uh, and then I'm going to get to some things that are probably a little bit more important. But we are going to look at some kind of shifts in terms of demographics and population. We'll look at science and technology, but also look at uh, complex what I call geotrends. Because again, this notion of trend convergence, if you're going to really kind of you know, get ready for the future, you want to be aware of what you think is coming, but also get a sense of the possible scenarios. You know, scenarios are ways of looking at change where you come up with a narrative, right? A story that is plausible based on not just facts, but also a certain number of guesses. And they all don't have to be grounded in reality, okay? They have to be grounded in how we think our world is changing or how our business is changing or how, again, a profession may be changing. Uh, let's take just, just one example of all this. So there have been a couple of cases. So I'm going to talk about two kind of, again, converging technologies that influence our society and culture on the, on, this is on the edge. I call them on the edge culture. We have, a lot of things are the edge cultures. You know, edge culture things are things like, you know, that sound wild, you know, but there's some facts to them, right? Like uh, the artificial intelligence, uh, there's a platform. How many people have, have played with Alexa? You know, it's an artificial intelligence. A couple of people, yeah? So it's this little thing called a dot or a large. It's basically, there are a series of, of AI devices that are being rolled out by companies. And I pay attention to artificial intelligence. One of the things I, I did at Apple, and I, I followed through in being CEO of an early AI company. Um, you know, artificial intelligence is simply put, simply put, it's, it's the ability to be able to mimic uh, human thinking, not accurately or not, just mimic it, right? And being able to have a system that can be trained similar to the way we train living things, but it has a certain ability to be able to then help with decision making or help with fact finding or help with sorting out complex uh, data to figure out sometimes just, you know, what's up. Well, Alexa was, there was a murder that was occurred, it was in the news, and Alexa, meaning the name for Amazon's technology, which is, you know, like a little box that is tied to the internet and has a uh, kind of an entertaining personality and you can go find things, it'll play music, it's kind of, you know, uh, I played Frank Sinatra songs, couldn't find them, played them for me, you know. I grew up with Frank Sinatra, I mean songs, not him. Uh, and my point was, it was implicated, the FBI wanted to figure out what Alexa knew because it captures information behind, you know, it's in the cloud. So did Alexa capture any information related to this murder to be able to even find who possibly might have committed this homicide? Imagine that, that you're living at a time where in artificial intelligence that's marketed by Amazon, it's like 30 bucks for this Echo, right? could possibly play a role. It sounds like a movie of the week, doesn't it? Right? And by the way, what else is Alexa listening for? Hmm. Right? So that's the era we're listening in. The other data point that relates to that is there actually was a case where a judge accepted uh, MRI scans of a witness's brain to enter into evidence to make a a decision if whether that witness was telling the truth or not, because there's a part of the brain that, was as, that is associated with telling the truth. Imagine that. How much trouble would we be in if you had one of those, huh? Uh -huh. Really? Is that where you said you were tonight? Well, huh. That's not what the MRI says, the scan says. You're reading those 10 donuts with Marsha. We're living in strange times. So accelerated changes, risks and opportunities, are in many regards, many innovations are changing culture faster than we can adapt and we understand. No word yet if Amazon's gonna give up the information regarding the murder, but you may see it as a movie of the week. Um, the question I have is, you know, are you ready for all this? Well, nobody is. 
So my goal is to try to say, look, we're living in a world where now there's concerns about how technology, such as robots, may take jobs. You're living in a world where there's lots of debates in terms of sustainability data. Is that real or not? What kind of risks are happening? How accelerated is climate change? You're living in a world where we're clearly in the midst of this convergence of trends, rising populations, demands on climate, exploding innovations that change the kind of norms in every area, whether lifestyle or whether they're certainly uh, business or whether they're just culture. So we're gonna investigate some of that. And the goal for you to take away, this is your third takeaway, right? Is to develop some kind of predictive awareness. So if you come away with one idea, one idea about what you want to investigate, one idea that gives you a bit more predictive awareness, because that's something special the brain does. You know, humans, our brains, as far as we know, are the only kind of brains that have the ability to time travel. Did you know you could time travel? Did you particularly know you could time travel? You look like you have an idea. You probably know that. Yeah. You had that look. Yeah, of course I know. He's going to talk about time travel. I've been there. I came to this lecture. I already know this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So our ability, have the ability to time travel. Why? We have the ability to be able to collapse time. We're the only species we know that has a brain that can actually think about the future. Think about that. You, you don't even... We don't even, we kind of take it for granted. But last time I checked, my dog was not giving it up, was not telling me, right, whether he could do that or not. You know, he does look at me, and I am paying the mortgage, and, you know, he's not, and he's playing all day long. So maybe there's something to think about that, you know. But come away with a little bit of predictive awareness. I want you to think about that as a takeaway. Also, the other part is recognizing that there's a tremendous amount of velocity. If you notice, the older you get, you know, things seem to be moving faster. If you notice that, no, weird thing. Like, we share things about age that are tough to decide to explain to teenagers because they don't have that sense of velocity. To them, it's all a kind of a transparent universe of stuff that happens now. Because you, you have to kind of live a little bit to see what that velocity is about. There's no way to really measure that, but I have a theory about it. So let's talk about the 10 top geotrends. Now, geotrends are my way of saying, yes, they're global, but there's something bigger and different about them, okay? They're not just the usual things. So I'm going to talk about not all of them. I'm going to list them for you. Then I'll break down a couple of them, okay? And then if you have questions about them that I didn't get to, ask me and we'll probably have some time, okay? The first certainly is geopolitical conflict. Geopolitical conflict, you know, we're living in an era of geopolitical conflict, uh, which is almost, you know, if you miss the news cycle for like, you know, if you, if, like a two hours, right? <laughs> you, you know, you miss. Wait a minute. What did the president do now? Wait. Ho. Oh, hey. Ho. Oh, okay. Let me say, or, you know, we're, we're at war with North Korea and Nordstrom, same time. Okay, what does that mean? You know, what does that mean, you know? Uh, I missed the news source today, and, you know, the um, half-brother, the, the North Korean leader, was uh, assassinated. Well, you know, I mean, not that that's going to change my day, but still, the news cycle has become very dynamic. It's almost like the news is eating our reality, right? But this notion of geopolitical conflict, it, it, first of all, just to put in perspective, it was always there. It's just more complex. And now we're dealing with dynamic elements. So I'll talk about some of the markers and flashpoints about that. Uh, I'll say a few things about it. I don't want to spend too much time on that because I got a lot of material. But let me just throw out a couple things that may be, again, in the edge culture. How many of you are aware of the battle for resources? This is, again, the notion of trend convergence, right? The battle for resources, because as the Arctic starts to melt, have you noticed all of a sudden you can get to that part of the world, that part of real estate? Have you noticed that? People, yeah, not a lot of people are aware of that. So what's going on up there? It's really a geopolitical conflict. It's very complex. You've got about five nations that lay claims. You've got the Russians that actually have put a flag on the bottom of the Arctic shelf, right? I mean, think about that, right? It's very cold. But also, it, but it means you can get to that part of the world. You can get to North America, North America can get to other parts of the world when you look at it. Maybe Sarah Palin was right. She really could see Russia from her <laughs> kitchen, right? I mean, it's only 11 miles between Russia. If you go to Alaska, it's 11 miles between Russian territory and U.S. territory, Alaska. Did you know that? You particularly, did you know that? You didn't know that, yeah, I'm telling you. You can go right over there, catch up with the babushkas, right? Uh, my point is, is that, that there's, a, there's about, uh, we're studying about 10 flashpoints around the world. One of them is the Arctic. 
that is creating a geopolitical conflict zone that we're very concerned about. So we do forecasts on that, we write about it, we start to think about it, we have clients that are push us into areas to study this. That's just one. There's, again, nine other big ones we'll talk about. Rapid globalization. Globalization has two sides. One is a side of creating more markets, better technology, more unified supply chains. You're lifting up parts of the global economy that need to be lifted up to create better prosperity. We know that populations that engage uh, north of $2,000 per capita, meaning per income per year, tend to not, above 2,000, tend to not be good places to recruit terrorists. Why? Because they have a hope about the future. Believe me, if you're making under $2,000 a year, think about that, right? What are the implications in terms of, do you, ha do you have much hope? So somebody comes along with a business proposition, right? Listen, we've got a deal for you, okay? Uh, if you look at the key driver of uh, the biggest terrorist organizations on the planet today, it's an economic driver. People actually have jobs. It's actually giving people the ability to be able, they're, they're run, ISIS is run like a global multinational, cross-border organization of which they're in what business? Oil. That's the economic source that drives that organization. And the recruitment area is particularly populations that have under 1,000, under 2,000 per capita. It's not just what you think is just an ideological basis. There's an economic underpinning, underpinning for this. We'll talk more about rapid globalization. There's a dark side of globalization, which is not all about prosperity. It's also about, you know, what do we do with the other 20 countries that don't have the infrastructure of the internet, don't have the full water and ag and food infrastructure for sustainability, for sustainable living, quality of life, who have not been able to benefit from globalization. In fact, it is having a destructive impact on part of India, destructive impact on part of uh, certainly uh, parts of Asia and, and even in uh, Latin America. So we have to, you know, this is a complex series of challenges. Oftentimes, the very thing that we're trying to solve has a uh, backlash. Example, um, there was a period of time where ethanol, right, corn-based fuels was on the rise. It was subsidized, it was on the rise, right? Well, one of the second order impacts of ethanol, which up to very recently, in fact, still to a certain extent, you go and fill up your gas tank and there's a this certain blend of ethanol that was mandated had to be in there. It created subsidies, economic, created jobs throughout the Midwest and all that. Well, what was the impact from that was, geopolitically, uh, the impact was food rioting in uh, Ecuador and Latin America. Why? Because they rely on what? Corn for making, and, and particularly impoverished, not just impoverished, just let's call them, you know, lower middle class, okay? They're the cost of tortillas, which is a stable, uh, went up significantly. So there were food riots r related to what g kind of gas you put in your car in North America. So the ag supply chain on the planet, which is part industrial and, 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 and part you know, consumer base where people eat and is part you know, commercial where people sell and distribute, it's connected. It's connected not just to each other in geographic markets and economic zones, but it's connected to lifestyle and culture. So uh, imagine you know, having to deal with the complexity of these challenges and you're a cargo of the world. Or, or let me give you this, this challenge. You know, w what do you think is on the mind of the CEO of, of General Mills, one of the biggest food companies in the world, operating in over 100 countries? The biggest thing is not how he's gonna sell more stuff, more food, the biggest challenge is how are we as a planet going to be able to feed people when there's 9 billion? How about when there's 8 billion and we're not doing such a good job when there's 7 billion? So we'll talk about that. And of course, all that's related to economic uncertainty. One of the big trends that's happening, certainly, uh, you know, in this audience, I can see, right, <laughs> is moving from aging to uh, health and human enhancement. How many people are enhanced in this, in this audience? Show of hands. Enhanced? Come on, get those hands up. You're, how many of you wear glasses or contact lenses? Yeah, you're enhanced. You weren't born with those, were you? Wow, look at the cute baby with glasses. Fabulous. How'd that happen? Genetically enhanced, no problem. Okay. 
Uh, how about people, you know, taking some kind of pharmaceutical to prevent an illness from occurring or some condition? Show a hand, something, yeah. Yeah, look at the hands, yeah. You're enhanced, right? Didn't come with you. Um, how many folks are taking a lifestyle enhancement pharmaceutical? Like, you know, Cialis, Viagra, show hands, just show, show hands. <laughs> Thank you up in the back. Thank you. Brave souls. Yeah. Tried explaining that to your grandma. Yeah, so we take this pill and, yeah, I'll tell you. We don't have to watch TV all night. I'm telling you, it's great. Um, so, so uh, how many folks are uh, taking or are aware of Prozac? You know what Prozac is? It eliminates your anxiety in Silicon Valley alone. You know, modafinil and you know, and Prozac takes your anxiety out of being able to create stuff. Yeah. And and how many folks are things you, when you start to combine? We talk about trend convergence. How about pharmaceutical convergence for health enhancement? Right. So you combine Prozac and Cialis, you're getting more and you're happier for it. Thank you, thank you. That, that's the laugh I look for. You get the prize afterwards. Well, yeah, so you may laugh about that, and it's something to be laughed about, but you know, we're living in a society that's predicated on a certain amount of health enhancement. We're enhancing our, our, we're changing our genomics, we're changing our immune systems, we're changing our brain with not just technology, but pharmaceuticals. Why? To live longer and have quality of life, right? But also to enjoy life. This is just on the edge of things like, you know, nutraceuticals, cognoceuticals. I mean, we haven't yet mapped out the brain the way we've mapped out genomics. We have, we suspect where there's learning, but we haven't really tied together the parts of the brain that have, oh, well, let me cut to the chase. Here's how it's going to happen. Ready? Okay, so one in three men I said are gonna suffer from Alzheimer's over the age of 70. Alzheimer's is much bigger than AIDS, much bigger than cardiovascular, though most of us die from cardiovascular and, and, and cancer. Cancer will be manageable in our lifetime within a decade. Cardiovascular pretty much is if people will take their medication and, and lifestyle, so those are fairly manageable or will be within five to 10 years. The problem with Alzheimer's is the numbers are huge, staggering. So how, Health enhancement is going to occur, particularly cognitive development, right? Cognitive enhancement, okay, is going to occur because we're going to do what? We're going, to, we're going to determine when you might be at risk for Alzheimer's, predictive diagnostics. Then we're going to go ahead and develop a series of drugs that will prevent it and maybe turn off that gene. But along the way, what are we going to find out? How to enhance your intelligence, not just enhance memory. What happens when you enhance memory? What happens? Could memory? What I mean? M imagine looking at a page once. Total Recall. Who wants Total Recall? It's the opposite where we're going, right? Isn't it the opposite of where we're going? Yeah. It, memory degrades as we get older. How about we just reverse that? How about it gets better? What would be the implications for society of people? Imagine. Think about all of you in this audience. All the people that you know who are over the age of 50 who are suffering for a little bit of, uh, or a lot of uh, memory loss, as well as preventing Alzheimer's. All of a sudden, becoming one of the greatest resources for knowledge discovery, to mentor the next generation of millennials, Gen X. Imagine that resource on the planet. Could that lead to a revolution in civilization? What do you think? Yeah. If, if they'll listen. <laughs> Darling, I can't help you with that right now. Okay, so let's go, let's move on. Um, my forecast is, is within three to five years, and there's about 100 companies working to defeat Alzheimer's now, that we'll have a variety of cognizant, well, new classes of drugs that are predicated on enhancing memory, defeating uh, uh, age-related drugs, not all of them, certainly, and, and not most of them right away, but the notion of these companies working to map the human genome regarding uh, degradation of thinking or being able to, to heal memory issues will happen in our lifetime. And, and there may be some people, for instance, like Tiger Woods, you may not know that Tiger Woods sees better than 2020. He had his eyes operated, operated on to be able to see better than 2020. Did you know that? So when he hits that ball, he can see better than anybody else. But we say it's okay because really policy hasn't caught up with that, right? And we say no, no to what, right? We say no, no to steroids. Uh, and, and, and 
but there will be eventually Olympics where you'll only be able, you have to take steroids to get into those Olympics. <laughs> Seriously, that will occur at some point, all right? Or steroids, give you another word. So, so health enhancement pharmaceuticals, which will, there'll be names for them, will become part of healthcare. And what it will do is it will save double digit billions of dollars across the world and also enhance people's quality of life. Don't forget about that, right? That's not why we're doing this. My mother is 90 and she lives in Florida where all mothers should live after 85, right? And I said to her, I said, Mom, because she used to play golf like two rounds, you know, a day, right? And I said, you know, now she doesn't walk so good at all. What would, would you be willing to trade those legs that don't work, kind of really let you down, right? For some robotic legs, cybernetic enhancement, right? Now you wouldn't have, you'd have to trade a certain amount of feeling. You wouldn't be able to feel your legs, okay? But you'd have performance, you'd have freedom, you'd have mobility, you'd be able to play golf, you'd be able to go to the store, you'd be able to drive that car. What do you think? And she didn't miss a beat. She said, fine with me, no problem. When? Just, can I sign up? When? When? <laughs> right? So you think about that as a society where, again, you have a mass market of people who are, one, are living older, right? You're going to live older than any population on the planet in the history of human civilization. You ready for that? You ready for that? All right. So if we could now give you mobility and enhance your thinking and enhance the quality of your life and, and be able to predict all of that here 10 years beforehand, what are the implications? Does that sound like a big opportunity? Yeah. Are we gonna, is that going to change the way we teach at universities? Is it going to change the profession of medicine, change the way our culture and society looks? Yeah. And that'll happen. That'll happen within the next five years. Um, we, depopulation is kind of interesting. It's, it, it's not a term everybody's familiar with. Japan, the United States, but certainly Europe is depopulating. There's more people uh, on the dole, if you will, and who are retired than there are in the workforce in Italy. A lot of Europe is looking like that. Now, you offset depopulation, which is what we're going to talk about. It's based on fertility. You offset it with what? You offset it with immigration. Or you offset it with stimulating people to make more babies. It's, you know, it's one or the other, right? And if you go to certain places, Japan, uh, Singapore, as examples, and there are some other countries, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're basically incentivizing people to get married, have babies. But it's really immigration. So countries that don't do immigration very well such as particularly Japan. Japan's kind of the laboratory for depopulation, right? Depopulation gets to the point where you don't have enough replacement workers to be able to keep pace with productivity. What do you have? You have a declining economic base. Unless you do what? Unless you bring people in, but also, remember, you can enhance them, right? What else could you do? There you go, yeah. And let me tell you, that robot's gonna throw out the garbage and not complain, okay? <laughs> yeah, so what's happening is the biggest in investors who are investing billions and billions of dollars in robotics are the Japanese, right? Because they really don't have it together and they know it culturally to do immigration, right? And that's driving what? Things like artificial intelligence, vision, sensors. But that, you know, that's an example that you don't, you know, the depopulation folks who are really kind of demographers and social scientists aren't really talking to the you know, roboticists and technology. They work together. <laughs> in other words, there's a recognition, a policy, particularly in Asia. Now, not too far from them are who? The Chinese. And they got the opposite problem. They don't really want more robots. They want more what? They want more markets. Um, we'll talk about rapid climate change uh, a little bit. Without a doubt, there is climate change for those of us who, you know, if anybody is still struggling with that, I can answer that question for you. you know. <laughs> there is an issue of how much of it is human-based versus nature. So, you know, just one thing I think we can all agree on is that climate change is happening, okay? That's how I kind of tell my clients, okay, okay, let's not argue, you know, how much of it is human-born or produced or versus natural because there's evidence, lots of good scientific evidence for both, but can we agree that it's occurring? And if it is occurring, Maybe we could shift to mitigation, management, innovation, development, you know, take a look at things that we could do to deal with that. So it's a, it's a, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but inevitably uh, we're living in an era of which every decision 
affecting culture, lifestyle, politics, geopolitics, and, and particularly security and defense and survivability is going to be predicated on climate change. All right, it's a big deal, right? The notion that national security and global security could be influenced by climate change. And therefore, the outer ring of that conversation is, is agriculture and, and food, water, atmosphere, pollution, and of course, jobs. So, you know, it's, these are not uh, silos to be thought about. They're about thinking about the interrelationships of them make the difference. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about some of the rest of these as we go into a little more depth uh, in terms of artificial intelligence, cyber. I'm going to talk about the ag food chain, talk about rising megacities. Most of us will be living in megacities. Megacities are 10 million plus. So in a world of a couple of billion more people, we are talking about a whole different kind of world of which things like transportation and energy and healthcare, uh, particularly delivered through two megacities or the rise of megacities, which are concentrations of wealth and jobs and earnings and innovation and quality and most importantly security could become very rich. So let me talk to you about, come and take those trends and I'm gonna break down some of them, not all of them. And I'm, I'm gonna talk about three global scenarios, okay? Now, these are future scenarios that will occur and I'm gonna give you a time frame maybe out over the next really 20 plus years, right? I know what somebody's, somebody's thinking, hey, I won't be around that long. You will be, believe me, you will be. That's the whole point of this, okay? <laughs> but let me give you three possible futures that we're heading towards, all right? Uh, the first is a fortress economies, or I refer to them as sovereign walls, all right? Now, if you kind of delink yourself from the current political debates, and you know, it's hard to do that, right? Uh, because it's juicy, you know, you know, fake news out there. I mean, it's just so hard to get away from it. So, I mean, who needs to watch reality TV anymore, you know? When well, we've got it, right? The news reports on it. So my point of all this is, you know, sovereign walls represents, you can start to see this becoming where it's not just the rise of populism, but it's societies that are attempting to be able to be sustainable within themselves. It's an insular part, not fully, not fully independent, not fully delinked, but it's a notion of sovereignty begins within our walls. Part of the Brexit really is the, 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 the shot across the bow of that in the EU. Whether the survivability of the EU is doubtful over the next decade if this trend continues. In other words, it, when I interviewed the uh, leaders of, of Brexit uh, and, and just regular folks in England and, and even the English that are living other places, it was very interesting because it was much more about controlling their own destiny, sovereign walls, than it was about not wanting to interact with immigrants or not, or, or, or even fears just about jobs. It was a notion that we need to pull back, and again, notice I'm not, this is not a value judgment of good or bad or moral or not, but the notion that sovereign walls is a trend point that others, and by the way, it, I'm not talking about politics of the extreme right or left, I'm talking about sentiments that show up with the population, that these are trends of attitudes about cultures that we're gonna need to learn to recognize. There will be certain sovereign walls that emerge that allow a certain kind of interaction uh, with the other economies around the world and other societies around the world for various reasons that are you know, maybe important just to them. But for all intents and purposes, they're gonna be more walled off societies within society. So think about the world then, in this scenario, it looks like the world has a variety of places you can go and you can't go, or in order to get access, you can go. By the way, we have a lot of that today. I mean, not everybody can move to Singapore and get a job. Uh, not everybody can move to France and start living there and, and get gainful employment. There are places you can go uh, that don't have these kind of restrictions. United States, I mean, we have a, uh, it takes two years plus to get here and many people are rejected and I don't want to go into all that in spe specifics, but what I want to say to you is this notion of, of completely open societies in a world where we have increased security threats terrorism, we have other kinds of issues regarding economic disparity, in terms of job allocation. These are gonna, this is, these are trends that are not going away, they're gonna continue. Um, Geochaos world, you might look around the world, and particularly parts of 
of, of Africa and say, well, that looks like geochaos world, right? Organized conflict. And again, that was my point earlier, it's terrorism and uh, this kind of uh, regional wars, there's about 15 wars that are going on, on the planet, some of them are relegated to particular countries or regions, but for all intents and purposes, this geochaos world could simultaneously exist in part of the world, just like today, all right, in, in parts of the world, it's what the world could look like, could be populated. And again, sovereign walls and geochaos worlds, right, managed conflict, right, can coexist in different parts of the world. They can trade, they can interact just the way political systems do today, okay? It's just that, you know, one is predicated more on, uh, I would say, you know, uh, laws and uh, whether it's a democratic process or an autocratic process, and the, the other is more of a, a network-based, uh, not anarchy, it, there's a managed conflict to it. Again, we have that in about, there's particularly five countries in Africa I'm thinking about. Now, where do we want, you know, what's kind of the ideal scenario if we kind of get prosperity right and globalization right and we start to really kind of win the battle against uh, those disenfranchised societies and grow them up? I mean, there was a time that there were conflicts between, what about the troubles between Ireland and, and, and England? Think about that. It wasn't that long ago. There, you couldn't go to England because there, you know, you might get blown up in a department store. You're not, I mean, we remember that era, right? Uh, the Sendero Luminoso in uh, Peru, for instance. I, I remember going hiking in a, on a trip to uh, Machu Picchu and there was a live firefight, you know, in, uh, in, my, in my airport trying to land in, in, in Lima because of the Maoist conflict there. It has not just been, conflict is not relegated today just to, you know, Muslim versus Christian versus American, ver you know. What I'm saying is that, that is an indication of challenges, some of them have been met and others are modern, have not been yet met yet. So this notion of collaboration world is really based on cooperative growth and development. So as a, somewhat of, as a, uh, I'm a globalist, but I'm, I'm an American, and I do believe that there's a certain degree of, of kind of, you know, I refer to it as digital capitalism, that capitalism creates and, and needs robust democratic markets of buyers and sellers and creators and innovators and makers to be able to create more sustainability, more prosperity, and it lifts all boats. And I think that's, you know, if I was a um, complete optimist as opposed to a realist, I would say, gee, that's where we, that's the goal. That's what we'd like to see happen. And by the way, a lot of the world has moved in this direction, right? Though you could go back and you could say, okay, wait a minute, You've got parts of the world that are stuck in geochaos world, Middle East, particularly in Africa. You've got uh, sovereign walls that already exist in parts of the world. So you might end up with these three scenarios also coexisting in the future, okay? And the question is not one which is gonna pre be predominant. The question is which are the ones that are gonna be, let's say, more preferable for, for you and more preferable for the planet, okay? So those are some scenarios to think about, and I can certainly take more questions about that. Um, global population. So let's, let me hit a couple of, of, of key trend points around global population. Uh, you know, this is, a, this is a, a dramatic, looking back, reality that most people just don't realize. Global population has doubled in the past 45 years. You may ask, well, why? Well, part of it is we haven't had really, you know, since World War II, we haven't had a worldwide, you know, We've had in episodes, isolated episodes of violence and terrorism. We really haven't had the kind of you know, wars that eliminated you know, Vietnam, certainly, and, and you can argue, but there have been smaller skirmishes. We've, and also disease. You know, we figured out, particularly with a number of epidemics and disease, uh, you know, how to be able to address those. So this population, you might look at that and go, well, that's good. Why? My thesis is, which I think is a little different, is when people feel hope about the future, as a society, as individuals, as a culture, we make more of them, okay? We feel better about it. We feel like not just nesting, but we feel like there's a hope for our, our children. When I've interviewed folks from conflict zones around the world, you know, the idea of uh, having families in a conflict zone, Middle East or Africa, it just, it's just not what they want to see happen. It's just, it's just not what they want. There's not a sense, when you don't have a feeling for the future, now you might ask yourself, those of us who live in a developed world, all right, who live in the United States, live in Europe, uh, you think it's in our interest for us to be able to help create peace and prosperity around the world so that more people have a future? Yeah, 
Because at the end of the day, that's what makes the big difference in terms of moving forward. So my forecast for 2050 looks like this. It's fairly robust, but I think it's, it's, it's backed up. I still look at uh, uh, Western Europe is somewhat less because of accelerated productivity, depopulation, they're struggling with immigration. You're looking at the population of, uh, uh, certainly that's being, that's the biggest driver of productivity is still population. And you look at China, inevitably. Now China, uh, even at, at look at, at 44 trillion compared to the United States at 35. You know, you could be off here 25%, 25% for, for everything. There could be disasters, could be problems that could offslide that. But just right now, we're on a trajectory. This is what the world looks like, I believe. Uh, by 2050. And well before 2050, you're going to hit numbers that are at least half of this and maybe exceed this. Uh, Russia, you know, and again, if you want to know kind of how we get there, some of these forecasts, uh, the average uh, life expectancy in Russia has declined. Developed nation, right? Declined to 55, uh, 56 for men. This is, and, and that's because of the healthcare system, they say, which I think to a certain extent they have a poor healthcare system, but it's also about what? The sense of the future, the sense of are things getting better, all right? And, and of course the disconnect is trying to understand, you know, why the population puts up with the leadership if their life expectancy is declining, what the implications of that. So you can see therefore different kind of dynamic, different kind of world if you have a declining population. Now, nobody's immigrating, by the way, to Russia. You notice that? Anybody here dying to move to Russia, right? Yeah, I'd like to age faster and die sooner. Yeah, that's what I'm looking for, right? Uh, no one's doing that, right? So, but if you understand kind of, you put things in perspective about, you know, kind of what's going on in a culture, in terms of economics and social, and you see kind of the pressures on them, it explains also how the leadership is operating, where it's operating, what the implications are, right? So. Now let's talk a little bit about the marketplace of the future, what it looks like and how it may be changing. The only competitive advantage is innovation. And most innovations, not just coming from technologies, but coming from technologies that are creating new business models. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, we talk about globalization, but real time everything. I mean, just imagine every market on the planet is now connected to your mobile phone. Every market, every product, every customer, every buyer every supply chain. And in many regards, maybe you don't need to necessarily go through brokers or sur surrogates or even vendors or retailers. Maybe you have the ability to be able to access, make, build, design yourself. How different would that be? Well, in the shoe industry, that would be phenomenal, wouldn't it? I mean, that might dominate women's fashion for the next you know, 200 years, right? They could design their own shoes in real time and have it delivered and maybe sell Copies to all their friends? Does that, does that interest you? I just want to know personally. I mean, yeah. So the notion of hyper-competition, the notion of a real-time global link of all supply chains, the notion that you could be a maker, seller, broker, buyer in one entrepreneurial platform, one dynamic ecosystem, sounds crazy, but it's happening. It's emerging. And that's kind of the world we're headed towards where the change is, you know, in other words, you think about it, Amazon is a company that doesn't have any bookstores. They're starting to actually have a couple bookstores. They're not really a retailer, but wait a minute, they're dominating retailing. Uber doesn't have any cars, but they're dominating transportation. What do you think the conversation around Facebook is? Right? Do they have any hard assets? Other than you know a virtual reality platform to figure out how to how to monetize, no, they have you. Their asset is your desire to communicate with your friends, and they've leveraged that desire better than anybody else has because you spend time on it. What are the implications for that? Less loneliness, more interactivity, more love, or is it the manufacture of desire? because everybody's doing it and therefore you need to do it because it'll be part of your community. So we're dealing in an era of radical innovations that are not just driven by you know, demographics and population. We're not just driven by you know, issues that are related to demography, like you know, how many babies are, we're making and where. And we're talking about technologies that are fused with 
demographics and prosperity. And the irony of this is, even though you're talking about Asia dominates future population growth, we're finding that in the cities, the coastal areas of China, which are the fastest growing for wealth creation, the faster a culture develops prosperity and wealth, the less babies they have, right? Which is very, in a study that was done around the world by one of my, my friends, thinks, thinks, we looked at the data, it was startling. Why? Because even though China dominates future population growth, which is the key driver, labor productivity, the key driver of, of the wealth, if you will, and economic and social power, if you will, uh, you know, on the planet, China has the fastest, by 2025, has the fastest growing boomer generation. It's a reverse of where they are today. And the big issue is, you know, will China grow rich before it grows old? Right? And interestingly, the reason I bring that up here is because we're still talking about technology as an offset to that. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little more about the Japan example. We are facing, in terms of demographics, which is somewhat mediated by technology, what I call a two-world challenge. It's the developing world, which is predominantly young, the average age in the Middle East of the population. Right? You're talking about the largest concentration is under 25. Even in China, at one point, 3 billion people, 720 million are under the age of 25. Another 320 million more than the population of the United States are under the age of 12. Just think, of, that's a different world, right? So we're, we're talking about this collision, right? I call it the cultures and collision, developing world, developed world, what the implications are. Half the world lives in cities, generating 80% of GDP today. By 2025, you're talking about 2 billion plus. So the rise of cities, not just megacities, 64 trillion or 6% of world GDP. It's only 600 cities. So it's a different way of looking at the world. When you're considering fertility, where are the cities where their most fertility is occurring? And immigration. Again, you've got to see these things in the context, right? As you can see, who's dropping the most and where? Fertility in every developed country has fallen beneath the replacement rate by two points. What do you notice on that list? Yeah, what's up with Canada, huh? Isn't that interesting? So uh, they're dropping in the developed world, they're rising in the developing world. Declining fertility rates, depopulation economics. Pay attention to Latin America. Latin America is gonna be in the upsurge. Very interesting dynamics. And particularly Latin American women, they're living longer, access to more wealth, strong middle class. But this also impacts what? The workforce. Over, I would say, almost 98% oh, of my global clients are having trouble finding, finding talent. And where the talent is doesn't have the training necessarily for what they need, but increasingly, you know, you have companies like IBM set up places in India, that's where the talent is. Increasingly set up businesses in China, that's where the talent is. And increasingly, you'll see them migrate over the next five to 10 years to where? Africa. Africa is gonna become very large. I mean, Latin America, yes. But Africa could be the kind of the startup continent, all right? And there's recently IBM, who's made a commitment, is going to train millions in Africa for their company. And again, it's a brilliant kind of move when you think about all the talent that's there. So you're going to see a lot of changes there. <laughs> Would you hire this person, right? <laughs> yeah. How many of us uh, who run businesses are comfortable with workers that don't look like us, don't act like us, don't think like us, but inevitably bring something of value. How am I doing time-wise, by the way? Hmm? Ten minutes. Ten minutes? Okay, thanks. Great. So I'm going to move through this. My point of this is, is that if we're going to be able to attract and retain talent, whether it's in the U.S. economy, whether it's in our organization, whether it's in our businesses, we got to think differently about you know, how much of our culture or business culture do we want to shift to make room for or to adapt around people that don't look maybe like us, right? That maybe uh, look completely different, not necessarily like that's an example of somebody that uh, is very successful in business and gets the internet from all of those jewelry piercings. So uh, <laughs> let me suggest to you that uh, most megacities, 
10 million plus will be in the developing world. Now, what I, I want to point out about this, which is really kind of interesting, is what you notice about these uh, megacities are what? They're predominantly, this is 10 million up, and generally they're between 10 and 20 million. They're predominantly one in, in the developing world, but also what you notice is they're almost exclusively populated along the coast in every region. Now, what's, again, trend convergence, right? You're a futurist with me for the next 10 minutes at least, right? Yeah. What's most at risk for climate change, sustainability, is rising seas, storms on the coast. Therefore, you know, when I showed this to my clients who manage trillions of dollars worth of real estate, insurance and other areas, wow. Because I said to them, how many of you have factored in climate change in terms of your risk analysis for your real estate portfolios? And that's what I heard two or three folks falling over. They left quickly, like those other folks. They just got enough. They went, wow, that's great. I'm out of here. I'm going to go do something with that. <laughs> yeah. So what I'm suggesting to you is, is that if this is where the migration, well before 2020, well before 2020, we, by the way, 2020 is just a couple of years away, right? But you're talking about in every region, there's significant risk due to climate change that, by the way, is unpredictable. I mean, even though the Navy has said we're looking at 7 to 10 feet by, you know, let's say 2030 or 2040, the truth of the matter is, can you keep a secret just between us? <laughs> Nobody knows. Because we're dealing in, there are some systems we know, right? We know that, you know, if you need to get a ride and you can't get a cab or you, you can call Uber, you know, certain things we kind of know, right? We kind of know that people will buy these things because they like it, women like this, men like that. We don't know there's certain systems that are so, have so many different factors, we can't predict them. But we knew that the world is getting more anomalous. We do know that there's high velocity uh, increase in storms. We do know that's predictable, but we don't exactly know where it is, uh, though I wouldn't recommend buying any real estate in New Orleans. My point is that we're talking about the highest risk areas with the largest concentration of populations are. So I would say that we've got about a 50 to 70% chance of one of these areas over the next five to 10 years being at risk for a major climate change related problem. Okay. So we may have to have resilient areas. I'm on a project to look at the resiliency for uh, creating this kind of new nano environment for San Francisco to be able to deal with superstorms. So the notion of these new designs, again, opportunities, could end up putting us in a different game. Because climate change is a reality. We don't need to argue how much of it is human or not. But the notion of sustainability in a world a few decades from today are things that we could do to change that world. And what would it look like to change that world? What would it, ch what, what would it look like to be able to say, okay, we, can't, we need to build entirely new kind of climate science. So things like artificial intelligence and big data and analytics and cloud computing, of which we have today, likely we need to point those, as I've advocated and others, towards trying to figure out these issues and challenges that we have not, particularly about a climate change world. Let me suggest to you also, uh, just in terms of energy, I'm going to say just a few things about energy. Along the way, there's one technology in particular that looks very promising over the next less than a decade, but certainly a decade and five years, maybe 10 to 15 years, and that is fusion. The largest fusion reactor is actually a couple hours from here in Livermore. And that fusion experiment, they're counting, I mean, it's three football fields long. You're paying for it. And it could end up creating a revolution. Entire revolution make the internet seem small is happening around that. And it could lead to a super grid. It could lead to, you know, being able to fuel, uh, let's say, a world where we have other kinds of technologies that will contribute to that, such as solar. And I, my point is, is that the world, we don't have enough alternative energy today to fuel the planet, but we could. And some of these could be very dramatic. I believe that solar-based systems, again, hold great promise, but we have a problem with economics, don't we? North America is energy independent. Did you know that? A lot of people don't, the implications for that. But maybe it's the wrong energy, some people believe. It certainly may not be as sustainable. So does it make sense to go ahead and invest in, in all these other new technology areas? Well, we actually are parallel processing. We are
developing new technologies to be able to accelerate that, and particularly one is fusion, that I think will be massively cheap, fast, distributed energy, I think within a decade. At least that's what the scientists are saying. I'm going to say a few things about technology and then finish up, okay? Is that, I got a few more minutes? All right, then take some questions? Great. So, a lot of times we talk about technologies being disruptive. Why? It disrupts, you know, did, were mainframes disrupted by mini computers, mini computers disrupted by desktops, personal computers, the mobile phone, the embedded nanophone. How many people have that nanophone? <laughs> nanophone, anybody? Any, oh, it's only 2017. Okay. This is the early stage of the innovation economy. Why? It, well, you know, computers were just like, you know, particularly personal computers. They just invented like a, you know, a couple of minutes ago, right? I mean, a couple of minutes ago, Apple, right? A couple of minutes ago, yeah, a couple of minutes ago, right? How many, was your grandma on the internet? she tell you stories about what it was like to be on the internet? Oh boy, let me tell you those. 1850s, yeah, let me tell you when we first got on. My first World Wide Web experience, yeah. yeah. So computers, the internet, smartphones, 3D printers, guess what? All this stuff that's going on, all right, is happening in your lifetime. This is all new stuff, right? And I mean, even Im impacting on cars and the stuff, I want to tell you where it's going. This is the early stage of the innovation economy. It hasn't happened yet. Why? Well, <laughs> increasingly, it's innovate or die. You either have to innovate or die. We've seen that in business cycles. Well, I'll give you a sense. Kind of, This is your map of what's going to happen. This is only good for the next 100 years, okay? After that, do not email me, okay? I'll be uploaded. I'll be in the... Apple upload area outside of Mars. Okay, so, you know, the exponential convergence of these five technologies will create wealth, prosperity, security, and opportunity, and maybe conflict and war as well, okay? Double-edged sword. But let me break you down what they are, okay? So, most of you are familiar with, uh, certainly, IT. Uh, IT relates to not just information technology, what's next for computers, artificial intelligence, certainly robotics, every robot or drone, it's basically a group of microchips all put together, but why is that important to you? It's because the analytics and the data that might transform, as I said earlier, about healthcare, might transform what we think about entertainment and media, virtual reality, that's IT. So the next technology is genetics. As I said earlier, I'm not gonna spend much more time on that, predictive promotional medicine that enhances our well-being. We don't understand wellness. We understand disease. Most of our medicine is predicated on disease. We need to have predicated on wellness. So this is going to be a very vibrant area that everybody is interested in. Nanotechnology is the manipulation of matter at the atomic level. I spent a couple of decades involved with nanotechnology, manipulation of matter. And again, the implications for that, for energy, the ability to manipulate matter at the atomic level and its implications for chips that are now being made at the nanoscale. But increasingly, we're talking about new kinds of structures and supermaterials that have the strength of steel, maybe, or the flexibility, or even embedded intelligence. So this is an area we don't have time to go forward into very deeply, but either in my books or online, Check it out. Nanotechnology will make the internet seem small. Super materials that will have embedded intelligence could tell you when your jacket needs to go to the cleaners. Okay? <laughs> that put things in perspective, right? Also, things like the Internet of Things, right? I, I wrote this blog piece for Huffington Post about how, uh, you know, when my toaster uh, fell in love with my car. <laughs> and they started, they met each other on the cloud and realized that the toaster was in the house and the car and, you know, Monique and Ralph, they had a relationship and I didn't know. And I got in my car and they were like sending email messages and showed up on my mobile device and I realized they discovered that they both like these Himalayan puppies on YouTube and they have a whole relationship going on, right? And they're sharing apps with each other and all that. I'm going, hey, you know, I thought you just make toast, but no, you know, it has an IP address. It's hooked to the cloud. My car is hooked to the cloud. They met each other in the cloud. I mean, what's going on? What's happening? That's the Internet of Things. You got it now? <laughs> somebody understands that? You know, when somebody asks you what's the Internet of Things, it's not about technology. It's about lifestyle. It's about culture. It's about, all right, well, my toaster loves my, check it out. It's fun. Quantum technology is a manipulation of time and space. So if nanotechnology is the manipulation of matter at the atomic level, right, 
Biotech is the manipulation of life systems, genes. IT is the manipulation of bits. Right? Quantum technology is the manipulation of what? Qubits. Those are elements. So this, the toolkit that relates to this hasn't been invented yet. We have a toolkit for, for biotech, right? It's called CRISPR. It was invented like not even two years ago. CRISPR, right? Right here in San Francisco for gene editing, right? Toolkit, right? Think about that. There's a toolkit for each one of these. The quantum information toolkit has not been figured out yet. It will. The, the analog of CRISPR for the quantum information toolkit is what? You're talking about very secure encryption, but also you may be talking about time travel? Who knows? Entanglement between, I mean, it, they're concepts that defy what we think about how even electronics works. But the quantum information toolkit could give us understanding of the mysteries of the world. And then finally, neurotechnology has to do with the way the brain works, but also something else very important. We're building artificial intelligence based on what? Neural networks, the way the brain works. Connections, synapses. I'm advising a Bay Area company, HPE, on their next generation memory-based technologies. So you're living in a time of dynamic change, nano, bio, IT, neuro, quantum. Now, when you put all this together, you're talking about a very different kind of world of hacking biology, living systems, hacking matter, hacking maybe even the planet in terms of geoengineering. And what does it mean in terms of lifestyle and communicating? It means you might have very small, smart, inexpensive information tools, entirely new businesses that are born of the convergence of these technologies. Always on, everywhere technology, technology that can enable you. But also I want to say that as we spin through these scenarios of the technologies in a connected, always on, AI enhanced world, we might also have a different world where you have not just the connectivity of devices and sentient aware environments, co-evolution of robots and artificial intelligence, but you could have also something very important to this region, if I can finish with that, and that is a connected economy, a feeding nine billion people. How about if you put all those technologies together? You would put analytics, and IT, and mobile, and maybe you start to deal with global waste. We waste 50% of the food that we make. Well, maybe this area has something to say about that. After all, one of the biggest growing areas in the world, and dealing with a fragmented supply chain of food is something the World Bank, the UN, every country is interested in. And ultimately, what if we were to look at supply chains and unify them? What are they becoming smart, connected networks? So we had visibility, where we don't have visibility now, simply put. What if we were to create a smart big data connectivity platform for transforming these global markets of food and ag and create a different kind of marketplace, a different kind of platform? What would that look like? Would we... Because one of these doesn't exist today. How many people know what a Bloomberg screen is? How many people trade on Bloomberg? Anybody? Anybody? Traders? 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 Bitcoin traders? Algo traders? Can we talk about that? Quants? Any quants? No. We'll get to you. My point is, is that the future, there is not a global unified supply chain for food. So it's going to be hard to feed people. It's going to be far to manage ag and food without that. And I'm calling for that because I think a geofood smart network harnessing mobile big data makes a lot of sense. So that may be something this area can take a lead in because of food, ag, technology, innovation. Great university here, right? It's on the leading edge, right? You want to stay on the leading edge? So I'll throw out that challenge. And with that, I will say thank you and take any questions you may have. Sorry, I went over a little bit. Okay. Well, thank you for a stimulating talk. And Turn your mic on. Mic? Is it off? Yeah. I didn't touch it. It decided. Should be on. Is it on now? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so we've got uh, some questions here. 
Well, you answer the first one. I'm going to first work with a prepared question. Um, all right. Uh, They're thinning out, so we got to get to their questions. Let's well. try. Let's try this one. Um, while I review the ones that people just gave me. Uh, what do you think? Um, how likely do you think it is, uh, given uh, what we just heard, that um, there will be concerted uh, action by uh, national governments or world organizations to come together and start addressing global warming? Well, I mean, to many extents, it already has. Um, it, it's regardless of who's uh, in the White House or you know in Downing Street or. Uh, it, you know, there is enough of a critical mass of change makers, and I think a, a critical mass of organizations. Just take business alone. I, I'm not a, you know, a, 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 the grand challenges that face the planet, I'm a big believer in the private sector taking a lead to be able to make changes, okay? And a certain amount the government can do in terms of policies and all that, but the business sector has already weighed in heavily. I worked with GE in the early days of Echo Imagination, uh, I've worked with at least, I, was, I don't think there's a big multinational that has not embraced climate change. So the question then becomes, uh, by the way, even the current uh, uh, Secretary of State, uh, I, I think that it behooves all of us, and, and, and those of us who are advising leaders, those of us who are stakeholders and citizens, and certainly leaders to be able to uh, recognize that uh, the future is ours to be able to shape. And climate change can either be a great disruption in a negative way or a great positive, whether it's about geoengineering or about clean tech or creating new innovations. I mean, I'd like to send the message to all our students that the future is yours. And I think that the, uh, the, the, the digital sustainability marketplace for creating solutions supporting ag, food. I mean, I'm in this space, I can tell you, it's screaming for innovations, it's screaming for more startups, it's screaming for more companies, I think, to come up with better solutions. In many regards, uh, it's, it's supranational. It extends beyond government controls. And I think that, you know, this is not 1985 or 95 or 2005. Uh, we're in an era where I think the evidence is such that the private sector, and particularly I think of the entrepreneurs of the world, can come up with solutions and should come up with solutions because this is the moonshot. Okay. So part of uh, a lot of what's driving this uh, phenomenal change is Moore's law. That's underlying uh, the the explosion in computing power and that, that drives change. But um, our questioner here suggests that it, that that law uh, where. Uh, computing power doubling every 24 months seems to be slowing down. And if, uh, do you see that too? And if you see that slowing down, how do you see that? Yeah, good impacting? question. So there is, uh, let me try to put this in perspective. So there's, there's a number of different, you know, laws or rules for what's going on in terms of the acceleration vectors of, of technology. You know, one of them is Moore's Law. And now there's something called faster than Moore's Law, all right? But it's, it's, let me kind of break them down. So there's, there's Moore's Law, which is, you know, every technology is doubling in power, every, let's call it every year. Same Moore's Second Law is that same, same technology power, it's cost half as much for all intents and purposes. So it's cheap, faster, more powerful technology. Um, you know, I have one called Canton's Law, right? Which I say uh, in all, with all, all pun intended. Uh, everything that can get connected will get connected. So in a world of Internet of Things, where everything has an IP address, everything has an antenna, the ability to create connectivity, we don't have to do anything. We just get out of the way, <laughs> and it'll happen. Machine to machine intelligence, we're starting to see that. But my point is, is that don't overplay these, these laws. For all intents and purposes, you know, Moore's Law uh, for computers didn't really slow down, it just was applied to the thing. So for instance, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, analysis of DNA sequencers, so just the, the analysis of DNA was actually happening uh, a third of Moore's Law, in terms of it was happening in every 90 days at a certain mm -hmm. point. So we've had, 
acceleration vectors that have even defeated Moore's law. If you just look at Moore's law as silicon, you know, doing more at silicon level, I mean, a hardware thing, then I think it's not, you're missing the, the maybe the bigger picture. Um, I think that Moore's law just, if you just consider every technology I've talked about, nano, bio, IT, neuro, quantum, robotics, AI, just consider every single one of them doubling in power every year or even every six months, the imp what are the implications? That's part of it. The other is the exponential increase in the information associated with these, which is happening even faster, and it's a different set of metrics, exponential change. So I, I, don't, I don't want to overplay these, these, these laws. You know, we're living at a time of uh, massive, very productive uh, disruptions, but the development of toolkits and capabilities to create a business or find a solution or meet these grand challenges, I think is, is more, you know, the, the cheap, fast, powerful technology has emerged. And I think that there's more technology in your, in your, uh, your supercomputer, oh, excuse me, your cell phone, than exists in the entire world before 1999. So I guess what I'm saying is, you know, you heard those kind of metrics, but really what I want to say is looking forward the next five to seven years will be like, you know, the past 25 years. So I would get caught up in, in the laws. I, I give you a, I'll give you a, an example of something that's happening right now is uh, two examples of this. So Watson, people have heard about Watson is an, is an uh, early AI that is being pioneered by IBM and I had an opportunity to work with Watson. And Watson we applied to doing oncology analysis to determine modalities for cancer, okay? It's the first oncology advisor, right? And we thought it would take, you know, we're, we're about two years ahead of schedule right now. And we're actually making, in, in uh, Bumram Grad Hospital, which is the largest private healthcare system in Asia, we're experimenting with, with Watson, and we're now doing diagnostics. And the doctors are watching and agreeing, but Watson is finding ways to treat cancer that were not met by the doctors. You need to understand the era that we're, this is real time. Mm. It's not like, you know, fantasy stuff. This is diagnosing. He's been, he, you know, Watson has been learning every single week for the past three years. And when I first heard about it at UC Berkeley and, and I, I was, IBM briefed me, I was very, I was, I was happily uh, surprised that they're moving as aggressively in this area, but what's happened is it's even accelerated because of new forms of AI that are self-learning. The other example is uh, HP has a, uh, a memorist or a new kind of memory-based computer that's 8,000 times faster than anything we've seen. And they're just, you know, it, it's not as fast as quantum computers. There's two or three quantum computers which are actually producing. We just can't measure them, and we think that they're fast. So I just want to point out that though, you know, don't get hung up on Moore's law or not, we're dealing in an era of very accelerating new innovations. I guess I'll have to make sure to answer it. Okay. Wow. <laughs> um, so one of the questions that uh, we, we've, we've talked about some of the impact of these changes on our capabilities uh, in a variety of areas. But one of the things that, that this raises is the question of what impact it will have on our social systems, on our social structures. And in particular, I'm thinking that in previous technological revolutions, you know, basically we've replaced uh, physical labor uh, in agriculture and industry with mechanized you know, uh, with mechanical devices. And then the first wave of computers we have uh, automated routine operations, routine decision, routine decision trees. And now we're entering an era where you're talking about machines self-learning, replicating the way the human mind learns and going beyond that. And so is there, I mean, some people are raising the possibility that even though this has been predicted before, this really may be the final technological revolution that absolutely eliminates jobs without creating anywhere near the number of jobs it eliminates. And and just without going any further, self-driving cars could eliminate millions of jobs across the, uh, the world. So what, what implications do you see for that? How yeah. do we prepare for the society of the future? So let me give you a framework, and I'm going to treat you like um, 
I'm talking to a head of state, okay? Any presidents out there? Prime ministers? Anybody out there? <laughs> I see a number of them, right? Yeah. So, um, now this is going to seem a little strange and maybe a little radical to some people. I don't think that every technology should be available. Why? Because I think I just uh, wrote a piece about this called The Human-Centric Future. I think we as a society are going to have to make some choices. For instance, there are, there are uh, biological agents and drugs and procedures that are only allowed in certain countries and not allowed in other countries. Why? Because of the ethical, moral s policies of that country. I think we are going to apply a certain degree of ethics to jobs and I think there'll be a, some things that robots are able and allowed to do, and I think there'll be some things they're not allowed to do. I think there'll be some things that artificial intelligence will want to do, and jobs to do, and then I think there'll be some things that we won't. And I think that that's, we'll make some decisions based on human-centric decisions that we'll want. I mean, I'm not convinced that, for instance, let's take, uh, you know, make, making a great wine. Or, or a great symphony, or just being a good caretaker, or being a teacher. I, I think there are, will become uh, uh, protected jobs that we insist on humans doing because we want humans to do them, and we don't want machines to do them, even if they do them faster, cheaper, better. Now, that's, we're not ready as a civilization to deal with this yet, but that's where we're going. But we're going to... Oh, I think it is in the United States and in Europe, and, but I don't think it's realistic in some countries. And then the question over there, I guess, is about soldiers. So again, you know, I, I'm not going to mince words with you. Uh, w we will fight wars with robots and artificial intelligence. Hint, we may be doing that to a certain extent now. But they're not autonomous. So again, pay attention to autonomy. When mm -hmm. we've passed over the Rubicon, It'll be for the development of thinking machines that have autonomy. Right now, there's a law or a policy that says our defense forces have to maintain control over those automated weapon systems, whether they're drones, whether they're guns. We could come to a point where we have enemies that are facing us that are using autonomous weapons against us, and we may have to make some serious choices, like annihilation versus survival. Guess what? Anybody want to vote now? I'm serious. Mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, I, this is, you're living in a world, let me remind you, because some of you may recall really quickly, what would have happened if Germany had achieved, or Japan had achieved, development of the atomic bomb for the United States? What do you think would happen? What do you think would have happened? Alternative history? Yeah. yeah, right. And when I tell you that it was close, if you look at it, the history of it, it's pretty close. So, you know, I'm not Pollyannish about this. We're living in a real world. There are some jobs we're not going to want robots and AIs to do. And yeah, there's other ones that we'll want them to do. And it may be a complicated decisions that may have to be in the best interest of the country and, uh, and, and, and maybe even the world, right? And those are, you know, those are choices and, you know, th those, are, those are decisions that we make. Yeah, no, that's a good point. You're drawing an analogy with the development of, of nuclear weapons, which was before nuclear weapons, I don't think too many people would have believed that it would be possible for mankind to actually stop escalating its that's right. power to... You know, it's weaponry. That's and right. In the past, any new weapon that was developed would be used and so on. And we finally reached the point where we've been able to avoid using them since, since that time. Well, these so. are complicated times, but uh, these technologies, for every technology, it's what we call a dual use. Mm -hmm. it, there's a positive thing, constructive thing, and there's also a negative thing. And, and we may have to live with those decisions. You may have to live with them. Well, let me, let me 
turn to a, a more hopeful question. <laughs> and this one comes from our, our viewers uh, it, at uh, CSUMB that are watching us uh, online. How can America play a part in assuring the success of developing countries? I think the best way is to uh, not just give money, but to give education and training. Uh, I would like to see a billion new entrepreneurs, of which 90% of them are in developing nations. You know, one of the things we do great in America is that we know what entrepreneurs are, we know what innovations. You look around the world, all the key innovations that have transformed the world, quite frankly, most of them are developed here, right? And you know what we do with them? We give it away. A lot of it given away. I mean, I, I was involved uh, in the Clinton administration as an appointee on uh, a private sector appointee for uh, nanoscience, nanoengineering. Nobody knew what it was. And we ended up, basically, your tax dollars were used to create nanotechnology, which now is a $20 billion market segment or more. A lot of that technology was given freely to the world. I would like to see us create entrepreneurs and educate and create school extensions in the cloud that people can come on, on online and, and be able to share the wealth of education and entrepreneurs. That's, gonna, that, that's the future of, I think, how we deal with developing nations. Not, uh, for, for instance, give me example, every developing nation, free internet. I worked on a project in Puntland, which is part of Somalia, right? And we started out by putting in, I bought the ISP license, the, my client bought it uh, from a tribe. We bought it for $3,000, walked into the Department of uh, the Minister of Communications in Puntland, right, which was uh, northern Somalia, and uh, bought it in the afternoon for $3,000. He said, pay me later. First internet service provider in Somalia. My point is, you know, let's put the internet free, give the internet away. Want to do that? How about that? And then... <laughs> we don't need to have it free in the United States. We're rich. We can pay for it. What's the big deal? Anybody who wants internet can get it any place. I mean, really, walking with Starbucks, you can get it. I mean, the most of the world doesn't have that. That's what we, we need to, if you want to stimulate the rest of the world, give them the internet, teach them how to be an entrepreneur, then create up a huge, you know, VC bank for fun things, and you know, amazing things will happen. Amazing things will happen. Uh, again, with the, uh, f keeping with a hopeful trend here, do you see any countries that have been historically at odds with each other becoming allies in the future? Yeah, Japan, the United States. <laughs> well, <laughs> that are current, I guess. Current? Yeah. Um, yeah, Israel, the United States. Hmm. Israel was alienated and was at odds through the Obama administration. Uh, and I think that those policies and, and, and that relationship was soured. That's uh, the biggest ally that we have in the Middle East, the only ally we have in the Middle East. Uh, hopefully th that will, I mean, today actually, the president's meeting with, with uh, Trump. Hopefully, uh, you know, they don't have a slugfest, everything works out good, you know? Yeah. It's a hugfest, not a slugfest. Uh, but yeah, that's an example of okay, something that's strategically important to the United States yeah. in terms of our, our global security, national security. Let me press you a little bit on a lingo, little longer time frame. Sure. The emerging uh, economies and societies of China, India, Brazil, uh, how do you see them interacting with the U.S. Uh, and Well, I, I think inevitably um, the, uh, let's talk about China. So, so China long term, you know, you're in a world where, you know, you're, you know, uh, uh, we have these bifurcated multilateral relationships in terms of power. So in the old world, it used to be Russia, bad guys, you know, Eastern Europe, bad guys. China, well, we'll get along, differences, whatever. South America, not strategically important, but good trading partners and all that, but fairly insulated environments. Uh, not strategically globally is that important. Now, you've got the complexity of China, uh, you know, manipulates markets, yet is our ally in many regards. It's a bifurcated mm -hmm. relationship. China and the United States need to collaborate more than compete in terms of global order. Without a doubt, the largest economies in the world, fastest growing in China, China and India particularly, we need to have a collaborative relationship. I mean, that's in terms of global order and, and certainty and what we signal to the world and also in reality. So I think 
the relationship with China in the United States, uh, particularly dealing with North Korea, there's, only, there's no way to deal with North Korea without China. And North Korea is going to be a problem. It's the problem child that's going to end up being much more problematic than the Middle East or any place else. And we need to deal with it. Uh, Russia is a sideshow, it's just not important. Uh, the strategic relationship with China and the United States, that's the critical linchpin. There's three linchpins to the global economy in terms of, in terms of security and stability and growth. Uh, uh, one of them is certainly, uh, it's the China, US, Euro platform. Part of it is economics that underpins it, but also they signal to the rest of the world, Latin America, Eastern Europe, uh, the rest of Asia, uh, particularly India, first, first off, they signal stability, cooperation. We need to have those three parts of the world cooperate, uh, uh, I think, more fundamentally, uh, peace and prosperity, and be on the same agenda and then I think it'll signal to the rest of the regions cooperation and all that. And I can't say that we're, I mean, this is long term, what ultimately makes for global peace and security. Okay. Um, and in terms of uh, higher education uh, a few decades from now, what do you, how do you see, do you see higher education institutions, uh, traditional brick and mortar institutions going away, changing? No, I, I, see, um, I see a role for, it's a little like, you know, when, when, when TV first came out, you know who fought the most against them were the movie makers, all the studios, because they didn't think anybody was going to go to the movies anymore, right? And then, uh, then the ca when cable came out, the TV, the broadcasters, networks fought against them, right? And then, of course, when the internet happened, everybody piled up against them. And what's happened? It's a big marketplace, big tent, right? So I view universities as being, uh, there's gonna be always room for more universities. I think brick and mortar is, you know, channel A, and online is channel B, and I just think there's gonna be a merging. So every brick and mortar is gonna have its own network, cloud network, and they're gonna become bigger, more expansive, bigger audience, bigger, you know, how many, uh, how many folks don't get into most universities, thousands, right? People apply, kids apply, they can't get in, right? Wouldn't you like to take those other three to 5,000 and plug them in online? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the most innovative brick and mortar, even uh, uh, New York University has the um, Gallatin program, uh, MIT, you know, uh, was funded to give away part of their BA, but what that did was to create more demand to actually go to MIT. Mm. Uh, again, one of the things we do really well, uh, and I think that the future of, I do think that an extension of my brick and mortar is what? I think there's a product line extension from a marketing point of view mm. that I want to go to brick and mortar and I want to take some online courses. And online is not going to be, you're, for instance, this is 2017, by 2018 or 19 or 20, we'll be in a virtual reality thing. I'll be talking to holographic students that are here, and I wanna. Mm -hmm. Some of them will be physical, and some of them will be, and they'll be ported here. That technology will, is, is gonna exist and show up, and it should. I think we gotta think bigger at the universities. I think the, the future of the universities are to have a unique brand for in their brick and mortar that also extends into the network and creates other kinds of virtual, uh, an extension of those brands in virtual reality. I, I think it's a bigger marketplace. You know, why don't you have, what's the total number of students you have right now? 7,100. 7,100. How about 70,000 from Africa alone? <laughs> I mean, really? Yeah. I mean, I, I just think, you know, uh, we, happen to do this right, and I think it's a big opportunity to leverage technology and not to, we don't need to compete with online versus brick and mortar, we need to expand the possibilities. Okay, now here's a practical question. Um, f assuming that you see a trend away from globalism, is that, I don't know if that's the right assumption or not, so I guess the first part of the question is, do you see some retreat from globalism right uh, now? I see a uh, unwise, uh, desire. Mm. I don't see a retreat. There is no putting the genie back in the bottle. She's out. She's making dinner. <laughs> She's operating the startup. 
she just got, I mean, really, I mean, come on. So globalization is not, but I do think that there is a role for, uh, you know, equitable and judicious uh, uh, being, bringing along the rest of the world that's being disrupted in ways that are hurting change. Now, how you do that without becoming protectionist, I don't know. I also don't believe that populism, this new fusion of populism and retreat from globalization, you know, is, is, is smart uh, because I don't think it does, in inevitably what any democracy wants is what? More democracies. And capitalism doesn't exist unless there's democratic markets to go sell your stuff to. Mm. And, and just let's say more markets. You don't get there from protectionism. And I never saw populism do anything that was profitable. You know, remember America, the founding fathers, the original founding fathers of the Constitution was in pursuit of life, liberty, and the pursuit of real estate. <laughs> Did you know that? Mm -hmm. And then if, what happened was, it didn't sound so good. Somebody, some futurist, right, might have been an older cousin of mine, you know, from way back, said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Do you want somebody in 2017 listening to this saying, wait a minute, what, they founded it based on real estate? The pursuit of happening. That sounds great. Pursuit of happening. Let's go with that one. Happiness. I can work with that. <laughs> That's the truth, though. They wanted to own their own real estate. And do you know to this day, in, in England, right, people don't own their real estate? What do they own? Leases, 99-year leases. So that's something that still persists today, right? Hundreds of years later. And the difference, fundamental difference between our country along with a lot of other things. Innocent until proven guilty, et cetera, et cetera. So the second part of the question, the practical part was, um, whatever you saw the trend then on globalization, one way or the other, uh, what, what is, how should this person invest to take advantage of those trends? You know, <laughs> Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you, and I'm, I'm going to tell you ahead of time, the president's going to agree with me. Without him even knowing what I'm going to say, he's going to agree after I say, say this. Watch, I forecast that. The best investment you can make is in yourself. Hmm. Invest in your health. Invest in your community. Invest in your, your local universe. Invest in your own learning, your own growth, your own learning. Okay? And share that with everybody. How am I doing? Pretty good. <laughs> so let me bring you back uh, to... Um, he's, got, he's dying to give you this card. Oh, this okay. Just, <laughs> he's just dying to give you this. You pay me five bucks later, okay? <laughs> All right, I'll save this one for after the question I was going to ask you, which is um, you talked about some potential strategies for this region. Um, in terms of uh, food, agriculture, and the fusion with technology. Can you elaborate on that a little bit more? Yeah, so, um, look, every area, you know, I, I was asked to, to, by the university to speak, and I was glad to, and they said, by the way, we wanted somebody else to maybe talk about, can you talk about, you know, the area? And I said, I'd be glad to, and I agreed to it before I really had any ideas, okay? Mm -hmm. But then I've been involved with these, these uh, efforts, uh, I, went to, I gave a presentation at a global summit about the need for a, a food and ag supply chain, you know, a way to be able to transform the food system on the planet. You know, why should there be two billion people on the planet who are hungry? Why should there be a billion people that, you know, we're all basically, you know, there's an epidemic of obesity in the United States, right? Why, how, how absurd is that? How absurd is that, right? We have to worry about losing weight and others have to worry about going to bed hungry, and their kids have to go. So without, you know, belaboring this, I, I, I said, well, the thing that the college does great, and this region, uh, Monterey Bay Area, does great, is has to do with food and agriculture. In fact, it does, it's probably one of the most robust growing parts of the world, in one of the more robust economies of the world. What would be great is if they were to, you know, form a way to look at in developing a way to be able to transform the supply chain with technologies that we have, but we don't have the data, we don't have the appreciation, we don't have the connectivity. But what would be a way from crop to fork, we would use technology to create more visibility, more transparency, more interactivity. And I was in a conversation with the, the head of the World Bank, which I, I mentioned uh, to you earlier, and you know, I said to him, why, you know, why don't we have an integrated global supply chain for food? 
so we could deal with issues of hunger, deal with issues of waste, deal with issues like that. And he said, I don't know, but we need to build it. So I'm recruiting. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, every, every I think, uh, you know, every region of the world, every place in the world has a, sh has a chance to be able to kind of assert in, 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 you know, their leadership, if you will, their thought leadership, and maybe their doing leadership. And, you know, I can't think of a better place to kind of, you know, uh, share that with, because one, there's a lot of white space, we don't know how to do that. We have some ideas, right? But this is a region that is fundamental to not just America, but the world in terms of growing. And, and I, I got to believe that, you know, there's going to be an interest in contributing to something like that because it could be epic, it could be transformational. If we could feed even 20% of the people by we waste half the food we make and we don't really have a good idea of the flows of food supply chains because we haven't been able to capture it, let alone visualize it, and then figure out how to better manage it. Well, we got to do that in our lifetime. You want to, you know, you want to be thinking about the big challenges in your life that need your thinking and how you can apply that. That's that's why we're on the planet. So I'll um, I'll take your question but rephrase it a little bit. Um, so there there is. Let's, I'll set the stage with, with verbatim. Um, it it's mentions here that um, corporations have been growing, uh, large corporations have been growing in size, so they're now eclipsing a number of uh, nations. Is there a trend here where uh, there could be a tipping point in terms of governance, in terms of the ability to control governments uh, away from citizens to corporations? Well, I think to a certain extent, that's already going on, right? But I don't want to be uh, draconian about it or conspiratorial, you know, global conspiracy. At the end of the day, uh, I'll make a forecast, right? If there's any hope in getting, you know, government doesn't move as fast as the private sector, okay? As I said earlier about, let's just say climate change. Do you think it's going to be sustainable for any leader on the planet in politics to deny climate change and get away with it with the private sector? Do you? Anybody think so? I don't care who you are. I, I think there's a, there, I just don't think that that's possible no matter who you are and where you are. So again, I am, am I a, am I a believer that the private sector, uh, and I mean the private sector, I mean big companies as well as small, has a great responsibility as stewards sustainability change agents. And guess what? M most of them get that. Most of them have efforts. Most of you look at what fuels and funds the environmental business. Now, are there still folks in the energy sector that think that coal and, you know, and, and, and gas and other energy, I mean, there's still a lot of work to be done to bring in folks that don't. But there's, a, I would say, you know, 80 to 90 percent of the uh, Fortune 1,000, 500, 100, are committed and are doing things for the environment that are good things. I don't think that they're placating. And I'll tell you, there's an economic reason. It's because 98% of all consumers of you are environmentalists, are concerned about sustainability, concerned about that. So they're listening. They're not paying attention. In other words, I don't have any illusion that government's going to solve the problems of climate change. I don't think they're going to solve it. I mean, stop smoking that stuff. <laughs> Well, you really think that's what, I mean, if that was the case, we'd elect different folks, we, wouldn't we? Yeah. Hey, two and two still makes four. So I think what, you know, we have a chance is, you know, your pocketbook, your purchase, the companies that want your loyalty, the companies that, you know, and, and they're brand names, right? They're all making, I mean, finally McDonald's, you know, my kids are already in their teenagers. And I mean, I remember we just stopped eating at McDonald's and they, they finally start fixing their menus because the consumers weren't buying anymore. You hold the power not just of the vote, but of what those companies do. The pocketbook. And I think the global customer pocketbook uh, has a lot to do with changing climate change vis-a-vis -vis changing the agenda of companies. Not perfect, not 100% there, still big problems. I still have, you know, friends that, you know, don't think that it's, it's Big a problem as, as, as it is. It's a work in progress, so join the battle. 
Well, you've literally uh, raised more questions than you've been able to answer. <laughs> and in many ways, I think it's been a stimulating talk. And, and if, I'd, if I'd had the option to do this the way we do it at the university, I would break us up into small groups, yeah. have discussions, and then report back. <laughs> but we can't do that, so I want to end with one. Could I, can I ask a question before you ask that? Okay. Were there any questions from students? Do you know? Yeah, so yeah, I've picked some of those All right, already. great. I want to make sure that they... And this I, is the one I want to end with. Okay, good. Uh, which is, you know, given all the trends that you've identified and, and what you see in the future, what advice would you give someone in college about to start a career? Yeah. So, um, my advice is, no matter what you're studying, uh, fashion, economics, business, uh, take advantage of, 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 take a course or two on uh, entrepreneurship, okay? Very important, okay? I'm, I'm committed, I came out of Apple, my DNA is you know, working with startups even now, uh, but I do really believe that entrepreneurs will rule because they're the young folks who, you know, particularly college students, let's say, who get to ask the question, well, why not? Why don't we try that? They're, you know, they're the ones that get to experiment, try new things, learn new things, break some rules, try some new stuff. So whatever you're learning, do that. Second is, learn something about technology. What are the trends in technology? Technology is a big driver of innovation. You know, what, what are, what's Amazon, Uber, What's going on with CRISPR? You know, my books are really written for everybody. Not that you should, everybody should read that. There's plenty of books to read. But the notion, find out something about what's going on with technology now. Because I think that's a critical part of a change driver. And the third is, uh, think big. You know, if you're going to spend your time building, you know, learning in school and getting ready for something. And I, I talked to, a, you know, a group of, uh, of students who are in their uh, juniors about where they're going. And they gave me this interesting challenge, which was, they said to me, you know, should we work with a startup that really is taking all my time and is, you know, is really, you know, I, it's, oh God, you know, I just, versus go get an easy job, you know, at a corporation f for the summer and all that. I said, let me ask the question this way. What is it you think your job is right now in your life? And they said, well, what do you mean? I said, what do you think you're doing in school? Wait, I'm going to school the other day. Oh, I'm learning. Right. So where can you learn the most on your this is about the summer internship. Mm -hmm. I said, you're about learning. You're going to have a pristine, this is a pristine window for you. You're in college, right? You want to learn, learn, learn. Will you have learning opportunities afterwards? Yeah, but you might have a mortgage. You might have a baby. You might have a career. This is a learning opportunity. Where can you learn? And then in that learning, find out kind of what you have a passion around. Because a lot easier to you know, work on things you have passion about. So passion, being an entrepreneur, learn about how to actually be an entrepreneur. Find out what technology, how technology is changing things and, and be part of that. And, and passion, passion, passion. Life is too short not to focus on, you know, I run into a lot of people who say, God, you know, I wish, wish I was doing what you were doing. Well, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, I, I run into two people who said, well, I had a career as a lawyer. I couldn't stand it, you know. And I said, well, who's, what's, exactly who's in charge of your destiny? <laughs> Is there somebody else? Oh, my mother said I should, well. <laughs> so I, I think that the last thought I would have is that to realize that you are the, the designer, you're the architect of your future. So, and every sh future can be shaped. Your own personal future, big things can be shaped. Think about all the revolutions that have shaped our world. Oftentimes it started with one person. You know, I work with Steve Jobs. He had this insanely crazy idea about a personal computer. Every company turned us down. Einstein couldn't get his math problems right. He needed his wife to actually do his papers. He was working in a patent office. Quite hardly put two and two together, right? Freud had a terrible relationship with his mother. Look what happened to him. Look, <laughs> my, my point is it takes one person to change the world, you know. Uh, I would say, be that one person. Go find a big problem that you want to solve, and maybe the whole world will beat a path to your door and, and help you do it. Thank you so much. <laughs>